So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmadu wa usalli ala Rasulul Kareem. I think this is our sixth program in this series, mashallah. Uh, I hope it's been beneficial to the people. And if they're keeping together the links we've made so far, um, that will be helpful, inshallah. There is a lot more content we can add, like many, many ahadiths we can actually put on the screen. And But I'm just going to let this go as a free talk, like conversation, and then may, maybe make separate videos on some aspects of this on on with the you know the sayings of the prophet or the verses of the quran but i think today you want to present some things from the quran inshallah um so bismillah let's get started so how do you want to proceed today so i think we understand the link between prophet muhammad and prophet musa particularly as an ummah and the rise and fall of the ummah from musa to isa in the first ummah and then from prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to isa in the second ummah and then the relationship between Prophet Muhammad and Ibrahim. And that specifically, yani, Ibrahim was specifically interested in his dhurriya, right? In his progeny. Uh, and that's where he prayed for Prophet Muhammad. So um, and so the Mahdi is a manifestation of that for the Prophet, the way the Prophet was for Prophet Ibrahim. And this is kind of like what we uh, also say in our durud. Uh, uh, by the way, just as a side note, I don't know if it would be interesting to you or not, but the Bible says that God will bless those who bless the seed of Ibrahim. That's right. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that American Christians, particularly the evangelicals in America, they consider it very, very important to support Israel is because they say that God's not going to bless America unless we bless the seed of, his, uh, of Abraham. And who is the seed of Abraham? It's the white, uh, red-haired Jews in Israel right now, apparently. So anyway, um, but that's, that's how they look at it, okay? So uh, now... So now that we've established a link between Prophet Muhammad coming from Ibrahim's dua and the Mahdi coming from the al of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from the progeny of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, so now where are we now, and where do we take this? Okay, so today we're going to start getting into the history of the Ummah itself, our own Ummah. Um, and I want to start with, uh, there's three elements to our ummah that we need to consider. One is who are Ahle Haq and perfectly Ahle Haq, right? So um, who, is, who is perfectly upon the Haq? Who is the most upon the Haq, right? So people can have ijtihati, uh, ikhtilafat, and it's not a big deal, but we're trying to determine the thread who are perfectly Ahle Haq in the ummah. And then there is in, in there the center and polarizing against the center, there's two polarities. One I call um, idealistic absolutism or idealism, which tends toward absolutism. And then the other side, you have a biopragmatic realism or realistic relativism. So these two polarize against themselves um, from the center, right? So we're going to try to identify these three elements, and inshallah, we're going to go through and trace each uh, one of these three uh, from the beginning of the ummah until the end of the ummah, right? All three of these come out of after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passes away. All three originate in a divergence of political theory, right? At the beginning of the ummah, they, they come out of a divergence in political theory. So I'm going to, at the beginning, um, I, we won't, inshallah, um, I'm just going to reveal for me, and this is my narrative, this is not Brother Omar's narrative. He may agree with it to a certain degree, and he can, he can argue or uh, affirm to whatever degree he does. But I, I'm presenting my particular uh, narrative today, inshallah, um, of history. And the challenges both the shared and the Sunni narrative and reformed narratives and seeks to come to a fair and adil narrative of history. Okay, so for me, Ahle Haq, uh, doing Qiyas from Ahle Ibrahim um, that, you know, the let me explain the that one Nabi what you mean. from the final Nabi Al Mahi came. Let me explain that for everybody so everybody's on the same page. Doing Qiyas from Ibrahim, what I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you mean by that 
is that the way Ibrahim uh, had two sons and from the two sons, one of the sons has many prophets and then one son has one prophet. So this kind of like is the carbon copy between like from yes. Ibrahim to then Prophet Muhammad, right? So they were on Haqq and this is a continuum as we have in the Durud, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes, and, uh, exactly. And uh, yeah, go ahead. It's very interesting. And, that the word starts with Allahumma because that is comes from Hebrew, Elohim. And, uh, and, and anyway, that's going to take the conversation somewhere else. But but yes. So okay. one way to determine Ahlul Haq is who is the pro who are the righteous people from the progeny of the Prophet. There's absolutely no doubt yeah. about that. Right? Yeah. Okay. So again, for me, and then there's this hadith, and there is mahfuz in the hadith, this idea of 12 imma or khulafa who are Rashid and Mahdi. And I think in one of your videos, you also mentioned that Mahdi is used for Imam al Hassan also in the hadith, right? Um, so this, uh, so for me, the, there's 12 imams starting with Sayyidina Ali al Islam going to um, a second Jafar, not Jafar as Siddiq, who's the sixth, but there's a second Jafar who is the brother of the 11th Imam. So there's these 12 Imams who are perfectly Mahdi, right? And and then at the end of history, uh, uh, on the wazan of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself being from Sayyidina Ismail al Islam, you have Imam al Mahdi from the line of Sayyidina Hassan al Islam. So I don't want to repeat that too much. I'm just stating that once for the record. Now, I want to give you some dalal for this from the Quran and the Sunnah that clearly establish the hikmah of this beyond what we've talked about so far. So, number one, uh, looking at the idea of the ayat al tathir. This is a very famous ayat. And in ayat al tathir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses, uh, there's three addresses, right? So there's Nisat Bisat. To Nabi and then Ya Alul Bet, right? So this discussion begins typically talking to Azwaj of Rasulullah and the whole discussion is about feminine related things, female related things, right? So you have, and then the third address when you talk to, when Allah says Ya Alul Bet, even that address occurs at the end of a long ayah. So just and so everybody knows, that ayah, the, brother, the whole the, discussion is the, talking about. Um, the, just so everybody's on the same page, we're talking about basically the tafsir of Sunan Ahzab. Okay, this is the surah that mentions this verse the brother is mentioning. It's mentioned for the family or the household of the Prophet. Um, and it says, We will purify you with a complete purifying, meaning they're going to be as purified as possibly can be purified. Um, and uh, so I want to see where you take that. For me, that's mostly referring to the wives, right? Yeah, I want to break down that last piece that addresses the Ahlul Bed directly, but I, I do want to, let, please um, just give me just a second on that. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I am I think that the, sh the traditional Shia interpretation and the traditional Sunni interpretation, both are wrong. They are both going to extremes. And there's a perfect, under there's a, very balanced understanding of the ayah that's perfectly clear rhet rhetorically. So in the Quran, you have this asloop, right? Uh, you have this asloop where Allah says the particular first and then goes to the general, right? So if he's talking, often this comes with the Asma al-Husna where Allah says something about a particular event and then he'll say, I'm Azizul Rahim, right? Or Azizul Hakim, right? So he'll go to the general sunnah after he mentions the particular. And so this is- Or, or the other way, wasn't. sometimes Allah will mention particular and go to the general. So it happens. That's what I was saying. Like that. But yes, I was saying your, from the your point is particular. correct. Sometimes particular to general, general to particular. So this does happen. Yes. So this what you're I'm saying is in this particular verse, when Allah says the words, that was moving a conversation from the wives of the prophet to a general state of being for his family. Yes, including the wives of the prophet. Right, wives. including the wives of the prophet. You know, how I, you know how I resolved this? I resolved it the other way, just so you don't understand how I think. So the ayah is very clearly talking about the wives of the Prophet, right? Mm, and it says, true. right? But then you have the hadith of Umm Salma, where the Prophet gathers the people, 
he gathers Fatima, he gathers Hassan and Hussein, and he says, Allah, include them in this. Okay. So I considered that this was an extension to what the ayah is saying, meaning that they're also included. That's in the it. traditional Sunni narrative. That's right. the traditional Sunni. Yeah. Okay. But I understand your point is absolutely valid that the Quran does talk about something and then go into the general. So it is possible, okay. linguistically speaking, that the the conversation was specifically to the family of the Prophet, meaning to the wives of the Prophet. And then when it made its concluding remarks, was talking about the people of the household in general, in the sense of everyone in the yes. household. Okay. Yes, because I have no one issue. of the things... Okay, but because to affirm that view though, but because one of the things that happens is that the when Allah addresses Ya Nisatun Nabi, Ya Nisatun Nabi, he's talking about specific ahkamat, right? Then when he says Ya Ahlul Bayt, he goes to the hikmah of why the azwaj are given exceptional ahkamat. Because these ahkamat are not for all the women, they're only for the women of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So why are this, these specific ahkamat being given to them? Because they are part of the Ahlul Bayt and as women who are part of the Ahlul Bayt, they have specific ahkamat. The only the thing wisdom, that... Why this is happening? The only thing that comes to my mind is this is the same surah that also mentions something very interesting. It's the same surah that says, Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah is the best of examples. And it is also the same surah where it tells the wives, You're not like any other women. Right? So that's yes, how exactly. the, the narrative in, in the surah, Surah Hazab, starts. And then it starts talking to the women, the women of the Prophet, meaning the wives of the Prophet. And then, But I think the Sunni narrative of adding that hadith to the Quran that includes, it includes Ali and Fatima, Hassan and Hussein. I don't think uh, taking that from the uh, specific to the general, meaning specifically from the wise of the prophet to the general, it doesn't contradict that. It actually affirms that. Mm -hmm. it, yes, it, it does. It goes along with that. Um, brother, uh, I remember that we don't want to stay too much on this. So let okay. me just say one one thing on the i want to break down the p part of the hadith um the part of the ayat which says ya ahlul bayt and goes into that so i just want to break i have a like a very pattern of usage a very deep analysis of that so let me just mention that really quickly so allah says um we have the irada to remove our rids from you right so whenever allah says we have irada and something allah's irada is takdir allah's irada in the quran is always god right. Like in Sutul Yasin. Like in Sutul Yasin. Inna ma amruhu ida arada shay'an fayakulu lahu kun fayakun. It's arada is connected exactly. to kun fayakun. Yeah. Yes. But arada exactly. means the, the will of Allah. Okay, so everybody understands. Yeah. Exactly. And and whenever Allah uses it in the Quran, I've done the analysis for pattern of usage through the corpus. Any time when Allah says irada, that ayat is the most important that the brother mentioned, but it is always ghalib. It is another word for takdir. So when Allah says this, it's almost an understated way of saying that this will happen. Mm -hmm. But if you know the linguistics of the Quran, it's not understated at all. It's perfectly clear. Right. Mm -hmm. Secondly, then we get what is his irada? His irada has two parts that affirm each other and both parts have two parts mm -hmm. first he says i will zapt in urdu we say zapt and it's the same it's close in arabic it means to make something be vaju to take it out of vajud itself mm -hmm. right and so he's saying arids and arids for me means the black thread of satan is shaitan in the heart unless removing arids other places he says i will remove rids so in surah um at the ayat at, um, at Badr, there's an ayat that's revealed at Badr, which is similar. Uh, it says, we will remove rids from the mu'minin, right, through the, through the water. Or the... But here it's saying, ar So the takmili, complete, superlative reality of a spiritual impurity is going to be made non-existent within the Ahlul Bayt, right? Mm -hmm. So this is this is only and they go on to and we will purify you a perfect purification, mm. right? So this this is exceptional for the Ahlul Bayt, and I do believe that it is for the Azwaj of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it is uh, for me most particularly about the five people that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the dua for. 
Okay. Um, uh, if you want to say something, brother, or I'll move on to the next. No, I don't question. disagree. I mean, we can disagree who was the priority, the wives of the priority, or Fatima and Hassan and Hussein. In terms of the present situation, uh, it's the wives that will have a bigger effect because there, there's so many of so many of age and so much wisdom there amongst the wives of the Prophet. But in the future, it will have to be Fatima. It'll have to be Ali. It'll have to be that just like when it was said, I will make you the imam of the people. And uh, and from my progeny, right? And so from the progeny of Ibrahim, you have good people and you have bad people, but those that were good were made the imams in the form of being a prophet of Allah, right? And then now you have prophet Muhammad and he's saying, look, say, do the same dua for me that, that, do for me the same dua that Ibrahim got, basically referring to that passage of the Quran. Okay. From, and from my, what about my progeny? So there will be people from the family of the Prophet, just like from the family of Ibrahim, who will come and renew the deen of Islam. So this is one of the ways. Uh, and I, I want to balance it in my narrative, and then we go back to your narrative, that this is one of the ways that Allah is helping the Ummah stay on the straight path. I believe with mm -hmm. the Mahdi, all of those issues will merge together, like Khorasan and yes. Syria, like the Mujaddid of every century with the family of the Prophet. So all these different, uh, so that's why it'll be so powerful, uh, is that, that that last Mujaddid will literally be in the location of guidance in the from the family of like all the sources of guidance you can say will merge into that person we call the Mahdi okay and just like Ibrahim his last uh, was Prophet Muhammad himself so for the Prophet his last will be and we'll get into that but I, I don't disagree maybe we can disagree on the priority so for you the priority is the Fatima Hassan Hussein and Ali right is that what you would say? And then the wives are kind of like secondary. And I can argue, yeah. Yeah. I can but maybe argue that, okay, the wives are pr primary for a certain time. And then the rest of the progeny uh, primary as meaning Hassan and uh, basically Ali and Fatima, radiallahu anhumah, they're, they're, they're part of Ahlul Bayt and the tathir of them is important from the perspective of what would happen over time. Like they're the future. Anyway, so this okay, is I, one way I, to resolve it. Go ahead. There's something to feel into that. Please. No, no, Bismillah. There's bismillah. something to feel into um, I just want to clarify that it is not the fact that they're wives that makes them secondary. Because I would say Sayyidina Khatija al -Islam is also on the primary tier, right? Um, so it's not the fact that they're wives that makes them secondary. It's um, uh, I, I can't quite articulate what it is right now, but I'm just saying it's not the, the fact that they're wives rather than relatives that is secondary for, okay. from my perspective. Okay. So I, I want to quickly relate this to two to other run, um, which is first off in Surah Abasa, I think it is, uh, there's this ayat which says only the pure touch it. Talking to them, talking about the metaphysical Quran that is, you know, on the seventh heaven, the pure touch it, right? So for me, this purification, when it's achieved in Imam al Mahdi and the, in my view, the 12 Imams, what that means is they have access to the, the hakikat of the Quran, which is Nur Muhammad. Yeah, I think you're referring to they have access to the, Quran, the, the real Quran, the I think you're referring to still waqi'ah la yumassu illa al-mutahharin I'm saying that might be it um, yeah. I'm not sure exactly so that that might be the one and then secondly uh, there's this ayat about surah Mari, uh, uh, Maryam al -Islam, where Allah says we purified her we chose her and then we purified her again yes right yes. so this sort of double purification or perfection of purification this idea exists in the Quran and I believe that's what's going on with the Ahlul Bad now brother I'm ready to move on to two more istilahat regarding Ulul Amar and Amirul Mu'mineen uh, are you ready to move on or do yeah. you Okay, so he wants to, the okay. brother wants to discuss two more terms. Ulul Amr, uh, Ulul Amri Minkum, Ulul Amr Min Minkum. So who are the Ulul Amr? And then who are, who is Amir al-Mu'mineen? 
right? That, that's what you want to discuss. I just want to relate these terms. I won't say as much about this thing, but it says ulul amar minkum. Who is minkum? It is the mu'minin, right? So the ulul amar from amongst the mu'minin, and amirul mu'minin for me is the same. It's the it's the wahid of of the jama, right? So amirul mu'minin is the wahid, is the superlative, the one, and then ulul amar minkum is the same terminology, but it's the plural. Mm -hmm. So when we know that this is a lakab that was given to Sayyidina Ali alayhi salam, that this is someone you have to, in the Quran is saying, you have to obey ulul amar minkum. I, for me, this applies to Sayyidina Ali alayhi salam first and foremost after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Do you want to say something on that? I mean, if that's uh, the, the, I mean, I take it in its linguistic sense, uh, uh, but if you want to put re some of the riwayat as the defining source of the ayah, then you can go with that. Yes. But I, I think it's, to me, more general. I think the ayah that speaks most highly of Ali out of all of the, like, clearly, like, you know, like Sarahat and like one is like there's a verse of the Quran and you can give it an interpretation based upon a riwayah. But one is like the Quran itself is pointing to someone itself in its own text. Right. Mm -hmm. So from that, it's the verse of the Quran. Anfusana wa anfusakum. Nisa'ana wa nisa'akum. Right. Abna'ana wa abna'akum. The verse in Surah Al-Imran that clearly to me shows that uh, that because Ali is here anfusana, like he is part of the self of the prophet, according to the verse, yes. literally. Yes. So, you know, you bring, meaning just so the audience understands, the prophet, the Quran challenged the Christians of Najran that had come to see the prophet to a, to a what is called a mubahala. Mubahala is you put your hand on your, you come together and pray to Allah that Allah, uh, destroy the one who is not in guidance amongst us right so the pro the quran gave this challenge okay you bring your family members and so in the family members ali the family member of the prophet of the men right so it says nisa anna wa nisa your women and our women so that's clear abna anna wa abna akum, our children and your children that's also clear but then when it said anfusana wa anfusana wa anfusakum yourselves and ourselves that included Ali from the family of the Prophet. So that's like clearly within the text of the Quran. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that Ali to, has a very high position from that perspective. And I would add to that that Sayyidina Fatima al Islam here is actually included as the one woman of the nafs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Uh, Sayyidina Fatima al Islam, in my view, is not the woman of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. She's the woman of Ali. So when she's also included, she's included through the nisbat of Ali, not through the nisbat of Rasulullah. I see. Okay, okay yeah, that's fair <laughs> enough too. Um, this is not for me to negate, like for example, the only time Allah uses the word Sahaba in the Quran is for Abu Bakr. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? The only yeah. time Allah uses the word Sahaba for a companion is for Abu Bakr. Right? Yeah. Because they were, is, is, is huma fil ghar. Right? Qala li sahibihi la tahzan. And when he said to his companion, meaning Abu Bakr, don't fear, in Allah ma'ana. So, there's a balance, right? So, so yeah. what the Sunnis have done, they have, what? They have negated the family of the Prophet. And there's a whole history of doing that. Uh, sometimes as a reaction to Shiaism, and sometimes because of political fear that uh, if this is the family of the Prophet, they will come on top, so we have to somehow suppress them. And the third reason is because it was the family of the Prophet that over and over again, and this is a history that I'd really like to dig into and talk about at some point, but it was for the first, until the Abbasid Empire, it was always the family of the Prophet that stood up against the injustices, not just Hassan and Hussein, not just Hussein, radiallahu anh, but over and over again, it was the family of the Prophet, the family of the Prophet, the family of the Prophet. And the governments of that time kept their eyes on the family of the Prophet because they knew the only other family that has the strength to gather the people and is a threat to us and will win the wins, the hearts of the people to, to overthrow us uh, was the family of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you have almost like this kind of like very Tazkiyah based uh, sayings, 
like Hassan Basri, Zain al Abidin, right? <laughs> it's almost like you are a fool if you don't look at this uh, mm -hmm. legacy, right? You're almost a fool. I mean, anyone who's studied it has been affected by it. And uh, so you have these du'as and munajat and like nasihas of Hassan Basri. In fact, Abu Hassan Adwi, rahmatullahi he considered Abu uh, Hassan Basri rahmatullahi to be the, this, the, the second mujaddid after Umar bin Abdul Aziz. The first mujaddid is Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He considered Hassan Basri to be the second mujaddid of, the, of that century. Anyway, the point being that there is uh, the, the normative tajdeed processes, and then there is the, the tajdeed processes or revival processes within the family of the Prophet. And uh, this has been neglected by the Sunnis. And of course, the Shias, they only see this, but even see this not in its proper, I think, context uh, almost many of the times. Yeah, so if you have something, this, that's, that's my narrative on this whole issue. Okay. Of, you mentioned the Anfusiyat of Sayyidina Ali al-Islam or the Anfusiyat, right, of the Alul Bad. And that was going to be one of the things I talked about. So I'm going to just say what I have to and say. And notice, so just the, for me and you, this might be interesting. The dua of Ibrahim was what? Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasula min anfusihim. So that connection is there too for those people that will be able to catch the Arabic. So the same word uh, is used. And, you know, uh, in Arabic, uh, like, nafsan, right? So if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has many anfus, right? That's Banu Hashim generally. But when if he has only two, un, un, uh, like, nafsan, right? One is himself and one is Sayyidina Ali alayhi wa So Sayyidina Ali is very particularly the nafs of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, especially in the ayat that you mentioned. And for me, um, if you know um, uh, the waqiyah where uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu is Amirul Hajj, right? And he's going with the kafla and with the uh, what's it called the caravan and Sayyidina Ali al-Islam is sent after him because wahi comes down after Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu leaves and that wahi needs to be recited um, at the hajj uh, yes. upon the people right yes. so Sayyidina Ali al-Islam is sent with that and he is the only one who can do that as the nafs of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa right. that's a very Muhammad. good point and there's a big connection between that and the Mahdi in terms of representing the Prophet Right, so he goes to Abu Bakr, which is also now interesting. Though now notice the hujjat, the hujjat is done by Ali, but the imarat is given to Abu Bakr. So, yep. right, so this is kind of like uh, the the so Ali comes to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr says, "Are you the Emir now?" Right, and Ali says, "No, you're the Emir still, but I've been commanded to read this on behalf of the Prophet." And which, ten, which are the 10 ayahs that he's told to read? The 10 ayahs that declare that now Islam is the law of the land. Mm -hmm. Right? And that the mushrikeen have four months to decide either they're with Islam or then they have to face the consequences. This is the same situation that the previous prophets, uh, previous people faced with when they were given a warning like... Uh, Lut or other prophets that were sent and said, okay, this is it. You either believe or you're going to be done away with. This was the same, Yeni, the same position, except it was being done by the hands of the believers. And that's why there's no Bismillah. I'm saying this for the audience. I think you already know. This was why there's no Bismillah in Surah Toba, because it was a very strict warning that, okay, now you have four months to decide what you want. And all of Arabia will now be Muslim and idols will be thrown off of all of Arabia. So now the Prophet gets this revelation. Ali goes to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is the Emir of Hajj. He says to Abu Bakr, I've been sent by the Prophet. Well, if you've been sent, are you the Emir? And, and I'm trying to also emphasize this kind of like uh, the level of discipline and understanding the Sahaba had. Um, and he said, no, I'm not the Emir, but I've been told to read this to the, to the masses, to the public. And so he reads it, and so he establishes the hujja on behalf of the prophet. Hujja means that now this is it. This is your your fate is sealed, and you have enough proof to know the truth. Hatta yasma kalam Allah. Allah says, okay, if you haven't heard the word of Allah, then go. You know, you can now hear the word of Allah and decide for yourself what you want. 
So yeah, if you want to comment on that, that's fine. And we can then continue inshallah. Inshallah. Um, just wanted to say that for me, that continues to be a reality, the Iqamatul Hujjah, right, upon Bani Adam in its most perfect form will of course be done by Imam al-Mahdi. But before then, also the Sadat have that, right? That is not, uh, you. everyone can give dawa. Everyone should give dawa. Everyone can give dawa. That's good. But the final Iqamatul Hujjah is still in the Anfus of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, that remains, that's still true for me. It's a living reality. So okay, the way I would explain that with the Durud Ibrahimiyah and what we're talking about is that even though the prophets all came from Banu Israel, from the progeny of Ibrahim, but there were also other people, also in the progeny of Ibrahim, who didn't have the maqam of being a prophet, for example, but they were also doing the work of Islam. How many Allah says of the rabbis? Uh, they fought in the cause of Allah and uh, they remembered the book, meaning they did the work of Islam, but the hujjah was done by particular people. And I think the hujj, the hujjah of the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad has to be done by his family members. That I have come on, from the family of the Prophet on behalf of the Prophet. This is, I think, is very logical. This part is very logical. And there's also one related reality where, say, you know, your children, you get ajr for your children because your act of viladat originates all their actions, right? Mm -hmm. So the progeny of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even through Sayyidina Fatima al-Islam, are at the salsul of the afal of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So there's also like, um, you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is al-mahi, but the one who is actually going to affect that reality is Imam al-Mahdi, you know, in the final takmili sort of way. Al-Mahi means the one who erases falsehood. So I'm just mentioning what the word al-Mahi means. Yes. Okay, so, um, By the way, so that have... narration is in, is the, I think it's the very last hadith of Muattab Imam Malik. The Prophet has six names and one of them is al-Mahi, the one who erases falsehood. Of course, he did it in his own lifetime, but then will happen at the global level in the person of uh, Mahdi, alayhi salatu wasalam, right? Um, so the last part, now this is going to be a little bit controversial, so we can spend some time if you want to, but I want to talk about hadith al okay? Okay. And hadith al uh, and the idea of vilayat and mulbiyat, right? Uh, vilayat and mulbiyat. So hadith al is uh, the, the most sahih and mutawatir hadith of all hadith. Right, there's only one hadith that maybe is a little bit more, which is the one where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Where whoever you know, whoever creates a hadith or attributes hadith to me, is going to be in the hellfire or something." To that, the matan actually, the act, exact language of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mahfuz in that hadith, but this is maybe the second. It is the most mutawatir, the most sahih hadith of all hadith. And basically, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going back from Hajjatul Bida and the Ghadir of Qum is like a pond on the way back to Medina. And he stops there and some of the caravan has gone ahead. He calls them back. Some are still coming. He waits for them. He assembles um, a mimbar based, uh, I think, with saddles. And he stands on it in the desert heat, in the middle of the desert, right? And he stands on it and he addresses <coughs> the people. And he says to the people, oh, people, um, he says a couple of different, there's a couple of different versions and I'll go into, um, I'll go into uh, the, the most famous, the Hadith Taqalin itself. And he says, uh, oh people, I'm leaving you with two Taqil things. And this root Taqil is used in the Quran for Qalun Taqila, I think Surat Mudathir or Muzammil, um, mm -hmm. when Allah says, I will give you a very heavy word, for, meaning the Quran itself, the Kalamat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala itself. This is the Sifat that Allah gives in Qalun Taqila. So the Kalamat of Allah or thakil. you know that's how heavy, that's the word that's used and so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says I'm going to leave you with two thakil things also in the Quran this this root is used for jinn and ins in Surah Rahman Allah I don't know the exact word but this root yeah. is used uh, because they are the two um, most noble creations right they have the amanat so the amanat is a very heavy thing so it's also used for them so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
And also one last point on this, when you know the Sahaba, if you know someone is close to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like, and they had their hand under his thigh or something or under his body in some way, um, or his, their leg under his body, and he used to get wahi, he used to be crushing the people under Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the, there was a real metaphysical intensification or something, and there was this weight to wahi, right? So that, that's also thakil, right? So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I'm leaving you with two thakil things, right? Two thakalain. And the first is the Quran in it is Hidayat and Nur. And the second is my, my Ahlul Bayt, my Itrat. And I warn you of Allah in my Ahlul Bayt. I warn you of Allah in my Ahlul Bayt. I warn you of Allah in my Ahlul Bayt. And this is a, a sloop of the Quran. Also in Surah An-Nur, Allah says, well, actually, I don't, I, I don't have it clear, Mahfouz, so I'll skip that. But um, this is an asloob of the Quran. When you remember something, remember uh, Allah in something or in regard to something, it means that you do adala. You fulfill the haq of that thing. You do adala in regard to that thing. Right? Mm -hmm. So when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is first, the Quran is the first of the thakalain, right? So whatever is the second of the thakalain is you know, it's a big thing, right? It's not a small thing. If the Quran is the first of the two thakil things, the second thing is 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 very important, right? Um, I don't know if you want to say something on that. Yeah, I don't have uh, any issue uh, with it so far. This is just confirming what we talked previously about that there would be people from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that would be forms of guidance. Yes. Okay. So. Um, there's two other versions. Um, I just want to quickly mention there's one where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that these two will not separate from one another until they come to Hodak Kothar, right? So the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt will be together. Now, of course, this affirms everything we've talked about from the Quran. And the second part of it, this is about Sayyidina Ali al Islam Maksus, is that I don't know if it's at the beginning of the khutbah or at the end of the khutbah, at some point Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, um, Oh, people, do I not have more huck on you than your own unfus, right? Meaning your own lives and your own relatives. Don't I have more huck on you than them? Um, and the people, of course, affirm, yes, you do. And so he says, whoever of Allah is Mola and whoever of I am Mola, then for him, Sayyidina Ali al is also Mola. And so here is where the controversy may be. For me, the, the correct terminology for Islamic governance uh, you can say imamat, you can say amriyat, but imamat is imamat of the muttaqin, right? So it's not really about government, it's about ibadat, who is going to lead the salah. This is more the imamat word, right? Amriyat of the mu'mineen is about more the inqalabi jamaat who is struggling, who's doing mujahida for kamutuddin, who is the amir of that party, right? Amirul mu'mineen. But here, Molviyat is like, like general governance. Vilayat is the political theory in my understanding. And it has to do, whoever is the pinnacle, like Allah is Mola, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Mola, Sayyidina Ali Alayhi Wasallam is Mola. So there's Molviyat of the Muslimin, right? And the, it, it is saying that, you know, there's a general Vilayat of the Mu'mineen and allegiance, a friendship, a congregation or whatever. And the pinnacle of that is Sayyidina Ali Alayhi Wasallam. That, that's the way I interpret it. And just one, uh, just one last point on this. I, I contrast that with Khilafah, the term Khilafah. For me, if you look at the pattern of usage in the Quran, this pattern of usage for the word Khalifa doesn't exist in the Quran. Yes, Adam al Islam is the Khalifa of, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's true. But this idea that the Muslim political theory should be referred to as Khalifa, because amongst the Khulafa of Allah, amongst Bani Adam, Imamat is the thing that determines hierarchy, right? So this way of using the term doesn't exist in the Quran. So one of the criticisms I have of the strictly Sunni political theory is that this terminology is not, in my mind, Quranic for Islamic governance. And I'll stop. What about, what about the ayah, Ya da'udha inna ja'alna khalifatan fil ard? Or, for example, Wa'adullahu alladhina amanu minkum wa'aminu salihat la yastakhlifannahum fil ard? 
for me, uh, these are, uh, you're the Khalifa of Allah. That's the way the Quran uses it. But if you know that the Sahaba didn't mean it that way, they meant Khulafa of Rasulullah or Khulafa of the Muslimin also. There was debate amongst this, about, amongst what it meant exactly. So it's Khulafa of Rasulullah or Khulafa of the Muslimin. In either one of those cases, that's not the way the Quran uses that terminology. What about Wa'adallahu ladhina amanu minkum wa'amilu saliha la yastakhlifannahum fil ardu? Could you translate that? Do, those of you who truly believe and do good deeds, I will give you a khilafa on earth as it was given to the people before. Again, for me, that refers to the khilafa of Allah, not the khilafat of Rasulullah or the khilafat of the Muslimin. But if you read the ayah continually, then it says what? Then Allah says, Allah says, And we'll firmly establish in the land the deen Allah likes for you. And we will change their state of fear into peace, meaning tranquility. So it seems like a political phenomenon to me. Uh, it is political. I'm not denying that exactly, but I mean, it's it, who is your Khalifa of whom is the question, right? So, being the Khalifa of Allah. So, either you're Khalifa of Allah or Khalifa of Rasulullah, right? So, uh, so, I guess that's, I mean, this is a subtlety issue. So, this is not, uh, but okay, please continue. Yes, I, I want to try to understand. What did you say, brother? I said I want to understand, so let's okay. please continue. Well, you, I think you did. It was just a subtle point where in the Quran, Khilafat is referring to being a Khalifa of Allah as in Adam is a Khalifa of Allah, so Bani Adam is a Khalifa of Allah. So this usage in the Sunni discourse is not strictly Quranic. That's, that's the only point. I'm not criticizing it as a big deal, but I'm just saying this usage is not strictly Quranic usage because it both the, no one in the Sahaba meant that we are Khulafa of Allah. That wasn't the understanding. The, the, the understanding was we're claiming to be Khulafa of Rasulullah or the Khulafa of the Muslimin. That was the understanding. And that idea is not strictly speaking, very strictly speaking, not Quranic. That's the point. I think mm. you understand it. So, nor is the word uh, imamat used in the Quran in the strict sense of political. I would, maybe I would argue that a little bit. I'm I'm trying to be. Gentle <inaudible> nasi imama. I'm going to make you the imam of the people. Mm -hmm. It can it can be or cannot be political depending upon which, like, if you take it, how it played out. Many times Bani Israel had other nations on top of it, but they had still had an imam amongst them. So if the Babylonians but took the Jews or the Assyrians attacked the Jews, mm -hmm. they still had prophets amongst them that were their imams. There's also the ayat, brother, where Allah says, uh, I think it's regarding uh, the Bani Israel and Firon. So it's talking about Bani Israel. So we intended, we had irada to take those who were lowly in the land, who were hakir or lowly in the land, and make them the imams. Right, collectively. To, yes, to point them the imams. So I think that's political to some degree. Yes. And, and for, I agree. But over there, I it's not talking you. about a certain individual, it's talking about collectively. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, so when I say, okay, I see what you're saying. I, there is uh, something to think about what you're saying. Yes. Okay. okay. But I don't so think the word I'm... khilafa or imamat have been used uh, strictly in the political sense as we understand politics. And that's what I call for above all else, brother, above all else, above all else. We have to use terminology strictly the way the Quran uses it. But that's, that that's, not our, big... that's not our tradition. I'll give you an example. Uh, as the sciences developed in Islam, they all formed their own understanding of certain terms. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the word uh, sunnah. In fiqh, in Islamic law, sunnah <laughs> means not fard. It's sunnah, right? Opposite of fard is sunnah. And uh, in hadith sciences, sunnah means something the Prophet did. Uh, or something he said or something he accepted, so on and so forth. In the mutakallimin, amongst the mutakallimin, sunnah meant simply that you're on the right path, right? Amongst the uh, people of asuliyin, the word sunnah meant 
uh, that it has strong Islamic foundations only, you know. So uh, the different sciences, as usually happens, they developed their own terminologies. Like a good example is the word kafir, right? Uh, I, that. I didn't mean that exactly. It's it's fine for those sciences to do that. But I mean, when we're talking about like determining the, you know, the fundamental, like the governing understanding in Deen of all those sciences has to be understanding the pattern of usage in the Quran itself. So like, okay, what, what would you say about the word kafir? The word kafir in my understanding is used for those people that were completely opposing the prophet. Not just anybody, because Allah calls those people that were just kafir, like in the sense that we use the word kafir, jahilun, jahiliya, jahiliyat al-ula, the people of the, who they didn't know. So ja, kafirun are those people who were opposing the Prophet. But in Islamic law, in the court system, if you don't say the shahada, you're kafir. Right? So it's like you're either Muslim or you're not Muslim, meaning it simply means you're not Muslim because you haven't said the shahada. Whereas in the word in the Quran, the word kafir is used for those people that are opposing actively against Islam. So, I mean, wouldn't that be a fundamental issue in which the terminology is different? Just clarify. It's like at the highest level, the governing understanding of the deen hmm. has to have strict be according to strict pattern of usage in the Quran. In my opinion, hmm. below that, you can have sciences and you can have diverse usage. I'm not against that. Right. Mm. But at the highest level, the governing understanding of the deen, the governing understanding of the deen, right, has to come from understanding the pattern of usage of terminology within the Quran in a very precise, not strict necessarily, but a very precise manner. Right. Mm. And then you can have sciences subject to that. I'm not opposed to that. You can have what you're talking about. But the, at the highest level, the governing understanding, in my view, has to you have to have clear pattern of usage sort of arguments to establish like haqqaiq of the deen. Okay. Um, if we can talk about this further, but I do remember there was a fiqhi opinion on istilahat, you know, which istilahat you can use and can't use from a from a nasuli perspective, which is usually my my perspective is usually like asuli from the asuluddin perspective so generally we say even if a istalah is used by non-muslims for example like in the case of hadithim and qadim this you know these terms that we have in philosophy islamic philosophy even they're not ours they're borrowed you know from aristotle and socrates and so on and so forth so the, the point i'm trying to make is that uh, some scholars of islam have said istalahat uh, are can be used and borrowed and brought into the Islamic discourse. Um, but what you're saying, and I agree with that, is that that we have to first look at the Quran and see how Quran is using that terminology or something similar to it to first be, to even be able to engage these other terminologies, right? You can't really engage another terminology till you discover, okay, what does Quran say about the concept of this terminology within Quran? I don't know, this is a subtle issue, but yes, please continue. Sorry. I'll just say one last thing. I also believe in the kifayat of Islamic terminology. Right? I, is the asmaha kullaha for me are, are fully within the Quran. So I feel, feel like, the, like everything in human experience can be described in Quranic terminology. Yes, so I agree. Just, yes, yes, I agree with I that. Also, Quran is the, the ultimate word. archetypes, right? Describer. And tafsilun kulli shayan also, right? Yeah, so yeah. So. Tafsilun li kulli shay, tibiyana li kulli shay, you know, uh, all that. Yeah. Okay. So now I think we're um, we're done with this discussion. And I just want to give one misal and then we can see where we're at. So th we've done many mithal, but this is one very important uh, tamsil. I'm sorry. It's very important tamsil that I'm going to show. So I say there's teen salam, there's three salams and three khatas that we have to keep in mind to have a sense of divine history. The three salams are the salam that Allah established in Jannah for Adam al-Islam before he was created and after he was created and upon him. The second salam is the salam established by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Jaziratun Arab, but more shiddat in Hijaz, more shiddat in Medina, more shiddat 
in uh, Masjid al Nabi and most shadid in Jannatul Baqi and most shadid on the Ahlul Bayt, right? So mm-hmm. it was perfect on Jaziratul Arab, perfect. But is most shadid on the Hijaz, most shadid in Medina, uh, and most shadid in, in Masjid al Nabi, uh, uh, Jannatul Baqi and on the Ahlul Bayt. This is where the salam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is most shadid on Baytul Nabuwa, right? Then there is the salam that Imam al Mahdi will establish on the whole globe, right? Mm-hmm. So there's these three salams which have th- their tamsil of one another, right? They're, they're they're very similar in certain regards. I won't go into it yet. The third, the third, uh, the three khatas which broke these salams are also similar, right? So there's the khatam of Adam al Islam which broke the salam of Jannah and he had to climb down the mountain, come out of Jannah and be on earth. Right. And then there is the there is a khata, I'm not going to name it yet or precisely, but there's a khata that happened after Rasulullah in our ummah that broke the salam. Now, if you don't think the salam was broken, then I mean, you know, I, obviously the salam was broken somehow. I'm not going to go in, but just on principle, something happened. We can disagree about what it was, mm. but something happened that broke the salam. There's something, right? right. Now, thirdly, there is when Imam al Mahdi will establish the salam, there's also uh, someone will eventually do khata at some point, right? But then the dunya will end because the story is over. You know what I'm saying? Because if it didn't end, the whole thing would start over, you know? <coughs> so, and, by salam and khata, I want the audience to be clear on what you're trying to say. Khata is very easy. To khata means a mistake, right? And uh, and sometimes that's all it takes that all of the mercy can be go down the drain because of a, a mistake. Uh, like in the case of there was harmony, salam meaning, a, I guess, a condition of harmony. Is that how you would define it? Or how would you define uh, salam in your mind? Uh, is, so there is a state of harmony and Adam makes a mistake and he comes down to earth, right? After that, uh, this manifests itself in different ways, but most completely manifested in the person of the Prophet وسلم, that he established Islam in the all of Arabia and he brought harmony and peace on earth. And then some mistake happened that made that also fall down. And then again, this uh, expands and decreases at different levels in history. But he's saying that this will now happen at the global level uh, this will happen at the global level, like this peace and harmony around the whole world, which is actually described in a part of the Quran, which I'm not aware Allah says, and we will open the treasures for them from the sky and from the earth and so on and so forth. So there will be this global tranquility with a peace of harmony. And of course, being human beings, what will happen? Somebody's going to make a mistake and make that also uh, uh, crash or come down. Um and, and it's also interesting the coming of Isa in this sense because if for Allah, for him, Allah says uh, uh, that and uh, peace upon me the day I was born and the day I'm dying and, and the day I die and the day I will be raised again. And remember the same words are also used for Yahya. And I'll tell you why this is interesting because the, the, the Messiah needs somebody to confirm that he is the messiah meaning there has to be a personality that meaning it, so the person who's going to confirm this is the messiah is going to be the mahdi and so that it's his counterpart will be the uh his counterpart meaning in the ummah previous ummah his meaning mahdi's counterpart in a sense is john the baptist from the sense of or from the perspective of the one who uh, says this is the Messiah, okay, and so uh, the Mahdi will uh, be there in that same masjid where the John the Baptist is buried, the Umayyad Masjid, and that is the masjid that Isa Islam comes to, and so this is the the Mahdi that confirms this is now Jesus, this is the Messiah. So now, uh, so what? Why is this important to what you're saying? Is that just as Allah said for John the Baptist and Isa, salamun alayya. Yeah. And then for Isa, another word is used, wa mubarakan aina ma kuntu. And I'm blessed wherever I go, right? 
so anyway, uh, the point being that there will be this harmony established around the world and something inevitably being human will happen to break that at some point, maybe after the death of these two people, right? Just as something happened after the passing away of the Prophet Sallallahu that broke that harmony that Islam was uh, growing with, something brought it down. I think I know where you're going to take this and I might have to <laughs> disagree with you at that point. <laughs> but we'll see inshallah ta'ala. Okay, so I, I, anything you want to add? Um, no, I'm, uh, no, I imagine we will and I'm glad that we can now. Yeah, inshallah. I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive, inshallah, and we will be gentle with one another, but I, we need to get into it. We need to have the conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, no issue at all from my side. Okay. Thank you, inshallah. Uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum.